Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We just ask that you would minister to us. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Pastor as he preaches your word. And Lord, our hearts just hunger for you. And we just long for you. So minister to us. In your precious name, amen. Please greet someone. How I am? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. A special welcome to our guests today. We're glad you're here to worship the Lord with us. Uh, we have quite a few uh, announcements, a lot going on this week, so I'm going to call up David at this time to uh, do our first announcement. And then you're next, Angie. So Wednesday is the last day to sign up to, be, to attend the Valentine's Banquet. Uh, yeah, the Valentine's Banquet. So that's for the adults. I'm not talking about the youth, but for the adults. So sign up on the bulletin board in the fellowship hall if you'd like to come. Just take note of that Wednesday. And also for Ash Wednesday, youth group will be coming to the service, but we'll start in the back. But Ash Wednesday, youth group will be coming to the service, and uh, also we'll be doing that periodically throughout Lent, the Lent season. Then also 5 o'clock, Valentine's Banquet set up for the youth. So 5 o'clock on Friday for the youth. And youth <coughs> sign up to help for the Valentine's Banquet, too. So, all right, thank you. Angie. I should say, uh, many of you may have not heard, but uh, um, Nancy Elmquist and Scott Elmquist's son, David, passed away uh, this past week. And so there is a, a funeral on Friday, and uh, Angie has an announcement regarding that. We were, instead of having, um, calling everybody and asking for help, we just, um, we would, we're just wondering if you guys could um, sign up for salads and bars and for help for the funeral on Friday. Um, we're looking at it being a, a quite large funeral, so we need as many people as possible to be able to contribute towards that need. So it's just on the back corner in the fellowship hall and just continue to pray for both families and thank you. Yes, continue to pray for the Elmquist and the Manon and uh, Emily especially. Um, visitation is on Thursday um, from 4 to 7 p.m. and then the funeral itself is at 11 a.m. on Friday with a uh, 10 o'clock uh, Right before that, 10 o'clock to 11, well, there'll be a, a visitation at uh, that time as well. Uh, but as Angie said, keep, keep praying for all involved. Uh, we do have many Bible studies throughout the week. I just want to highlight a couple of them because uh, normally we wouldn't have Bible study at our house uh, this Tuesday. It would be next Tuesday, but uh, we're going to be switching it to the second and fourth Tuesdays instead of every other. So we will be having Bible study at our house uh, this Tuesday at 6 from 6 p.m. till 7.30. Uh, and then the other Bible study, uh, the, the Thursday night one, is going to be canceled uh, since we'll have the visitation that night. So uh, we do have Bible study on Tuesday night, but none on Thursday night uh, here at the church. Um, this week does begin our Lenten services. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. Uh, so we do have soup suppers starting as well, 5.30 uh, and then the service at 6.45 each uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we are going through a uh, theme of uh, the letters in Revelation. And so we'll be, my, I will be preaching on Revelation 2, 1 through 7 uh, this Wednesday. Uh, we are also on schedule for Meals on Wheels again. I know we just did that a few weeks ago, but uh, I think this happened last year too. 
Uh, we are on once again from March 1st to the 15th, so the sign-up sheet is out there in the entryway. Uh, please sign up if, you're, if you are able to help. Uh, and also, one last thing, it is in the uh, bulletin as well, or the insert, uh, the pregnancy research, uh, the, the baby bottles that we're filling with, with change and all of that, uh, they are due this next coming Sunday, next Sunday, the 18th. Uh, so please remember to have those in um, by then. Uh, that is all I'm going to mention. You guys can look at the rest yourself. At this time, let's stand and sing our opening hymn, number 132. seated. Uh, the only thing I have on my list uh, for prayer requests today is uh, certainly keeping the Manon and family, Emily, uh, and the rest, and the Elmquists uh, in your prayers at the passing of David. So uh, uh, as a body of believers, as a, the church is a body. In many ways, it's, it's, it's our loss, too. We feel the pain, and we're called to feel the pain of our brothers and sisters. So um, keep them uh, in your prayers. Anything else that I can add to the list? Kenny. I'd like to pray for some of the people right now that don't have no jobs. We will do that. At all. All right. We'll pray for all those uh, that don't have jobs right now. Right. Anything else to add? Dave. Yeah, I could just 
say a prayer for that uh, for the people to be safe in that snowstorm that they had in Chicago, Illinois? Yeah, we'll do that. We'll pray for all those affected by uh, winter weather. Anything else we can add to the, our list? Yes. Well, I'd like to just thank everybody for all the prayers for with Lori. And, uh, and I, I really thank everybody for all the food that's been delivered. Um, and I just appreciate the family that we have with uh, the church. All right. Anything else we can add to the list? Aaron. What? Oh, you had one too. Brad, pray for Brad, um, having some anxiety issues over a situation, okay. Aaron. There are two men that I know that are, are fathers and husbands in extremely broken and very dark place and have been contemplating or attempting things that are just wrong and they're reaching out and just that God would work in their life and with those that are in their lives to help bring his life. All right, so pray for two men uh, who are... in an extremely dark and okay. spiritually dark place. Pray for two men that Aaron knows who are just in a, a dark place right now, despairing over their, their sin and all that. So, all right, we'll pray for them. Anything else I can add to this, Lori? What's her name? Bernice. Bernice. Pray for Bernice, uh, who fell and you said cracked her hip. What was that? Her tail. Tailbone. Pray for Bernice. All right, anything else to add? Tony. Pray for Paul as he uh, travels to Africa and uh, works there for three weeks and uh, for a safe return as well. Anything else to add? Yes. Praise that my mom, Sharon, is home from the hospital. She was having some uh, heart and kidney issues. She spent the last week or so in the hospital. And she's home now doing fairly well. Sharon, home from the hospital, having heart and kidney issues, yeah. but she's doing better. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes, Becky. Unspoken request? Yes. Yes. Yep. Glenn is back. Can I do a prayer request? Yeah. Praise that Glenn is back, but also uh, concern that uh, tribal warfare has broken out uh, not too far from where you were. Okay, so we'll pray for peace, God's peace there as well. Yes. Um, pray for Joanne. Um, pray for Joanne. Uh, the, the leg wound still, right? Yes. Okay. Continue to pray for, for Joanne Von Olin, uh, surgery this week. Uh, to close her leg wound that she's been having issues with. So, anything else, Jackie? Okay. Continue to pray for Emily and all the other things that go with uh, losing a loved one. All right. Anything else? Deb. Is Charlie here or Hannah? No? They're down there. She's doing better. Doing better. Okay. What's 
her mom's name? What's that? Janelle. Janelle. Uh, so Janelle, um, what, what was the issue again? I forgot. Knee surgery. Knee surgery. That's right. Yep, that's right. Uh, doing better though. Okay. Yes. Certainly. Praise God that uh, death does not have the last word in our life. Anything else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, shocked and saddened, Lord, over the passing of David. And Lord, we, uh, you, you know how the family uh, is doing, Lord, the thoughts, the, uh, the emotions, Lord. Uh, Lord, help us to be uh, recognizing that, Lord. Help us to um, just simply come alongside them, Lord, uh, re- realizing that uh, we can't make things better, Lord. But help us to minister to them, Lord, in whatever way we can as their brothers and sisters in Christ, as they... As they mourn, Lord, let us mourn with them. And Lord, uh, we just pray, Lord, that even in a tragedy like this, Lord, that your name would be glorified. Lord, as as Deb said, death does not have the last word, but uh, your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, you have given him to us so that we might have eternal life. And that is is the hope that that we have, the hope that David had. And we pray, Lord, that that he would, uh, Lord, experience that, Lord, and help us, Lord, to, to know as well that, uh, that he is, Lord, with you now. And so, Lord, we just continue to pray for Emily, Lord, and all the other things that surround uh, the death of a spouse, all the other uh, arrangements that need to be made. Lord, we just pray that you would give her strength especially. Lord, we pray for uh, Sharon, who's home from the hospital now, Lord, with the uh, and doing better, but um, we just pray that you would continue to help her recover from the heart and, and kidney issues. Lord, we pray for Janelle as well, who is, who is home and doing better, but uh, Lord, we just pray that you would help her to, to recover from the, her knee surgery. Lord, we pray for Bernice as well, uh, who fell and cracked her tailbone. Lord, we pray that you would give her um, uh, recovery, Lord, healing, and, and that she could um, get back to the uh, things that she needs to do, Lord. We pray for Joanne as well, who's having surgery to close that wound on her leg. Lord, be with her. Uh, Give her peace this week as she goes through that surgery and be with the doctors. Lord, we pray for all the, uh, those who are without jobs, Lord, and and looking. We pray that you would um, help them, Lord, to find something that, uh, that they can do that they enjoy as well. Lord, we pray for uh, Brad who's been having some anxiety issues, Lord. We pray that you would give him peace, Lord. Let him know that uh, you are uh, wanting for him, Lord, peace and assurance, Lord. And we pray that you would bring people alongside him to help him. Lord, we pray for all those dealing with uh, extreme winter weather around the country, uh, lots of snow in certain areas and lots of uh, bitter cold. Lord, we pray for those who um, are experiencing that, Lord, that you would protect them on the roads and and even in their homes, Lord, where um, people may have lost power or whatnot, Lord. We just pray that you would give them uh, uh, peace, Lord, knowing that you are in control. Lord, we pray for these two men who are uh, both fathers despairing over sin and just in a dark place right now, Lord. Uh, We we may not know them, but you do, Lord, and we just pray that you would use the people around them to uh, point them to you, Lord. Point them to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for Paul as well as he travels to Africa and and around Africa. And we pray for his work as he uh, is there for three weeks now, Lord, and and for a safe return. And for the family, too, as they are are left back here in Minnesota. Lord, we thank you that you brought Glenn back. And Lord, we pray that, uh, as he mentioned, the the tribal warfare going on not, not too far from where he was. We just pray, Lord, for peace. We pray that your word, Lord, would take hold of hearts and and change them. We pray for all the unspoken requests as well, Lord, all the things on our hearts and minds. 
Lord, secret things sometimes, Lord. Sometimes just things we're not at liberty to share. But Lord, we pray for guidance and wisdom for all of those requests. And Lord, we, uh, we also pray, praise you, Lord, for um, the church body as a whole, Lord. All the support that uh, the DeRosiers uh, had recently. Lord, we thank you for um, using the doctors, Lord, for, for bringing your mercy to Lori and the family as uh, uh, she had the surgery. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for the blessing it is to have brothers and sisters around us. And Lord, I, I just thank you, Lord, for the assurance that you give us in your word that you love us, Lord, that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, not death, not anything. And so, Lord, we thank you for those promises, Lord. Help us to remember them always. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to call upon Mark Olson to read scripture. Would you please stand? The first lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through chapter, six of, uh, chapter 4 of verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 4, 6. There's a contrast here between the law and the gospel, the good news. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who, have, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore... <clears throat> Since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the man, minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let there be light shining from the darkness and made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The gospel lesson is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 9, 
verses 2 through 9. This is Transfiguration Sunday. You'll notice in your bulletin, and this is an account of that. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was, Jesus, transfigured before him. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let let us put up three shelters, uh, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, they looked around. They no longer saw anyone with them except Christ Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find that on the back cover of your hymnal. Let us confess our holy faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. is really how unworthy we are and how we are so sinful and the only thing that gets us through is Christ's grace.
time we'll call upon our ushers to receive our tithes and offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is only by your grace, Lord, in sending your Son, Jesus Christ, that we are saved, Lord, that we have anything good at all. And so, Lord, we want to give back to you, Lord, out of love for you, Lord, because you loved us first. And, Lord, we pray that These gifts, Lord, would be used for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
continuing to go throughout uh, the Old Testament lessons on Sundays. Uh, And yet, even though I'm preaching from Exodus 34, uh, I'm really going to be preaching on the verses that Mark read earlier as well, because often in Scripture, uh, it makes more sense when you read it in light of other verses. And so I will be referencing the two uh, portions of Scripture that Mark read as well. But we're going to be talking about Moses here to begin. Uh, Moses was the leader of the people. God called them, called him to that task. And much of the book of Exodus, especially chapters 19 through 34, speak about Moses. And we know many things about Moses. Called up to Mount Sinai to speak with God face to face. Moses asked God to show him his glory. And God responded, you can't see my face and live. And so he spent 40 days and 40 nights upon the the mountain and he received the Ten Commandments and he he came down and found the people worshiping a golden calf. And he broke those tablets and, and judged the people accordingly. And so he went back up the mountain, Mount Sinai, and spent another 40 days and 40 nights up there and got two new tablets with the Ten Commandments on them and brought them back down. And and this time, though, something was different. His face was shining. Many times Moses went up and down those mountains. Uh, But we're just looking at this one, this this last time here where he, he came down and his face shone. Mark mentioned earlier this is Still the season of Epiphany, Transfiguration Sunday is that last day, last Sunday of the, of the season. And Epiphany looks at the revelation of Christ, making him known throughout Scripture. So let's stand as I read from Exodus 34, verses 29 through 35. <clears throat> When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he, told the people of Israel what he was commanded, The people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and your word is truth now. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us in that truth. Lord, help us to understand and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be looking at the face of Moses and the face of Jesus and how that applies to us today. We see that Moses, as he came down the mountain, his face was shining and he didn't know it at first. And we are told here in Exodus why his face was shining. It was because he was in the presence of God. He was in the presence of God. He was reflecting the glory of the Lord as he fellowshiped with God's glory. It's almost as if God's glory rubbed off on Moses and beams of light were shining from his face. And he ref- Moses was a man who reflected the goodness and the love of God. It wasn't just his face that was shining, but his character shined as well. Do you remember the time when Moses, after the incident with the calf, interceded for the people? How he prayed 
for the people. He poured his soul out for those guilty people. Do you remember what Moses said? He said, blot me out of your book if you don't forgive them. I remember Paul saying much the same thing. Moses, along with Paul, loved the people so much that he was willing to be condemned in their place. See, this is what made Moses God's man for the job. And yet, in the golden calf incident, they rejected Moses as God's servant to them, as God's prophet. And in doing so, they rejected the Lord as well. And so, Moses comes down the mountain and now his face is shining. This was a sign from God that this certainly was God's man for the task. It was unmistakable now. They saw the glory of the Lord in Moses. And what was the reaction of the people? They were afraid of Moses. I would probably be afraid as well. Even Moses' brother Aaron was afraid. What does, this, what does this tell us about the people? It's a much different reaction now than it, when it was when Moses came down the mountain that other time, right? With all the revelry and sin going on. Now the people were in fear for their lives. In the face of Moses, they saw the glory of the Lord. They saw that their sin separated them from God. And with this glory shining upon Moses' face, they felt the presence of God as well. See, this shining of Moses' faith, face searched their hearts and their minds. It showed them that God was holy, that he took sin seriously, and that sin requires judgment. They knew God's anger towards sinners. They had experienced it in the past, and now they were repenting of their sin. They certainly knew that the wrath of God was real, and so this shining upon Moses' face as he comes down from the presence of God is a sort of validation that Moses is God's man. And yet we find that Moses, Moses hid his face by covering it up with a veil. Scoot by that one there. Right? Moses, we find out, hid his face from the people. And naturally we we would assume that it's because they were afraid, right? That's the way I've always understood it. Moses did this out of concern for them. And maybe there was an element to that, but Paul, and what Mark read earlier, gives us the true reason why Moses hid his face from the people. Now, he didn't hide his face constantly. He said that when he went in to speak with the Lord in the tent of meeting later on, that he would uncover his face and speak to the Lord. And that when he would come out and tell them what God had spoken, he would also have his face unveiled. He would reveal that glory to them once again. It was only in his regular, normal activities that he let his face be covered by that veil. And so we see that The people, in reaction and in fear, do not come near Moses until he calls them, invites them to come, reassuring them that it was okay. See, now, you know, God had revealed his glory many times to the Israelites throughout the history, but this was the first time that God revealed himself, or revealed his glory in a man. And Moses, as his face shined, uh, it's likely that his face shined for the rest of his life. Because we're never told that it stopped, just that it faded, but that it would come back as he 
visited the Lord once again. So why, why did his face not just remain glowing the whole time? Why did it have to fade? What's the, what was the purpose of that? Well, Paul tells us that it was because it was an illustration of the law and it's fading away. Right? Moses hid his face under a veil partly for judgment's sake. For those who did not believe. Not everybody, when he came down from the mountain, would have believed. There's always a mixture of believers and unbelievers. But for those who did not believe, that veil remained in place. So they couldn't see that the law was fading away or that the that glory of his face was fading away. And just like the law, Moses shining face caused some discomfort for many. They feared him. But the very fact that God's glory was present with them was also a comfort. It was good news. And the fact that Moses had to go into the tent of meeting and and uncover his face, it's almost as if he was being recharged, as we would recharge a battery. As his face would the glow from his face would, sh- would fade away. He would go back in and speak with the Lord and his face would shine brightly again. The fact that his face faded away and he had to go back and, and kind of recharge, as I said, it was important because if his face had faded permanently, the people would have gone their own way again. They would have said, oh, this is just a normal man. This must not be God's man anymore. Where is, where is his authority now? That's all of our tendency. And Moses, Paul also said, was a meek man. He was a meek man. He was, uh, had to go in and repeat that exposure to God's glory until his death. And so as I said, there's, there would have been people that believed, trusted in the Lord, and those who didn't. And this is the purpose of the veil. Unbelief was met with the veil of Moses. Well, let's look at our lesson, or the section of Scripture from Mark 9. You see the face of Jesus here. This is the transfiguration of Jesus, where his face and clothes and hair and fingers all would have shined. And yet, It wasn't a reflection of God's glory, but it was inherent within Jesus. He was God himself. He was the light of the world. And we see what what an impression this made upon his disciples. They too reacted in fear. Because this was a manifestation of Jesus' true identity. The Son of God. It was shocking was fearful. And yet, what does Jesus tell them to do at the end of this verse? And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He's telling them to keep it under a veil. Keep it under a veil. Why? Jesus was wearing a veil just like Moses, the veil of his flesh. And this is what is happening in the transfiguration. His glory is shining through. See, most of the people that Jesus would walk around and and talk with and live amongst saw Jesus as just the normal guy. Probably a little bit higher than normal people, maybe on the level of Moses and Peter. It's not Peter, Moses and Elijah. And Peter thought, thought this as well as we see in his suggestion, hey, let's build tabernacles or tents for all three of you. And he didn't know what he was saying, as we see. Moses, or Peter often put his foot in his mouth throughout his, uh, probably his life. <laughs> but notice here as We see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah are there talking with him. And here we see that Moses finally gets that vision 
face to face with God. 1,500 years later, but his prayer was finally answered. He spoke to Jesus face to face. See, Jesus is not some normal dude. Jesus is the Son of God. And as the voice said from heaven, we are to listen to him. This veil of flesh that Jesus wore was in place to hide God's glory from those who would reject him. Jesus would only show his true glory to those who trust him. Peter, James, and John. On the Mount of Transfiguration, his glory was revealed. And yes, his glory had been revealed in his miracles. And certainly, later on, his glory is revealed in the cross and in the resurrection. But the transfiguration is is different. This is his glory that he would have again in his Father's presence. We see here on the Mount of Transfiguration that Jesus is the lifter of the veil. See, we talked about the law and the gospel earlier with Moses. And the glory of the law, because it does have a glory of its own, we find that it fades. The law, with all its commands the old covenant, the sacrifices that it entailed, it was all fading. And we see when we go back to Exodus that unbelief was met with the veil of Moses where the commands to do were always in place. And yet, those commands were fading because they weren't able to keep those commands. The Ten Commandments are intended to remind us of the darkness of our sin. And that if we rely on our ability to keep the commandments, we will remain in our sin. And so for those who were persistently rejecting Jesus Christ, all that remains is their sin and the fearful expectation of judgment to come. But the glory of the gospel and all the promises surrounding that, that never fades. That continues to shine. For those who believe through the Holy Spirit's work, there is the expectation of joy and everlasting life. And now, instead of the Ten Commandments, Jesus gives his own command, love. Love God. Love your neighbor. Let the light of your faith, shine in that way. Let it shine Jesus' love. Let it be the good news that sin has been removed. And Jesus replaces the old covenant with a new covenant. He replaces this, these old commands with new commands. He replaces the old sacrifice with his sacrifice. And he established and he increased the gospel. And it was his righteousness, not the people's. His righteousness that is a gospel promise for us when we trust in him. Just as unbelief is met with the veil of Moses, do this, do that, faith is met with Christ lifting the veil. And saying, done. Finished. Well, now we're going to take a a quick look here at 2 Corinthians, uh, the verses Mark read earlier. And we're going to see that Paul starts talking about our faces shining. And how they do so now in this life. And of course, it's all because of Jesus. Jesus. And how now he looks upon us with favor. What is favor? Favor is grace and mercy. Favor is forgiveness of sins. We find that Jesus has made it possible for us to be glorified in the future. In this life, it is hidden, in, it is hidden behind the veil of our flesh as well. 
But we're supposed to be walking by faith, not by sight. But we're promised that the veil is removed for us as well, so that we might gaze upon the beauty of Christ and his work. Whenever the gospel is preached, if you are, if you are a believer, the veil is lifted. The work of Jesus in purchasing our forgiveness becomes clear. We see the glory of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The face of Jesus, as bloodied as it is, is good news to us. The face of God turning away from his Son is good news for us. And so because of Jesus, we are recipients of God's glory, but also God's peace. Paul says we do not lose heart. The Spirit has freed us from sin, from that bondage to the devil. That eternal separation between God and man has been spanned because of Christ. He's made a way for us. And now instead of fear and trembling, we have joy. Joy over the fact that that veil of Christ has been torn, has been removed. See, Jesus is the key to all of the scriptures. He is the lens by which we interpret all of scripture. As if he, uh, we might say all roads or all verses of scripture ultimately lead us to Christ. And so as the veil of his, fl his flesh was torn on the cross, it created a way for us. And now we are the church, the bride of Christ. We've been saved, saved from our blindness to sin, from our unfaithfulness, from the God of this world. See, Christ alone has shown or shined in the church's heart. Did you catch that line in our hymn that we just sang? Uh, number one, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. The bride of Christ is precious to Jesus. He draws us near to himself. He is the lifter of the veil. Right? If you think about a wedding and the, what the purpose of that veil was for. I don't know, did you have a veil, Sarah? You did, didn't you? Good job. As the church, as the church, we need to be recharged too, just like Jesus, or just like Moses' face needing to be recharged and, and let it shine again. But our recharging station is the cross. It's the empty grave. And we learn about this in the Word of God. Earlier, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm saying that the law is bad, because the law is certainly good. But God uses it for, for our good. The law has a lot to say to us, in fact. It points us to our sin. It shows us that we still fail on a daily basis. The law still condemns us when we are giving in to our flesh. The law also, though, for us as believers, becomes a guide. It teaches us how to be more Christ-like. How to love our neighbor. How to love God. The gospel, on the other hand, reminds us of God's love for us. And that, as we are reminded over and over and over again in scripture, that that never fades away. His love, his word, it never fades away. Even in the sacraments, we talk about baptism as the beginning of our life of faith as Lutherans. We talk about the Lord's Supper strengthening our faith. See, this is how God recharges us, reminding us of him and his love for us. The sacraments are vehicles of forgiveness. They bring the cross to us. 
And now when we, when we look at Jesus, just like Moses, we reflect his glory. And hopefully we're, we're doing that to other people. We're reflecting that glory to them so that they can see Jesus through us. You know what? The, the word of God and the sacraments, they keep, they keep the face of God unveiled for us. That's the importance of the word and the sacraments. So that God's face is continually shining upon us. And so in this life, in the Christian life, it's a life of suffering. But we also know that we will share in his glory too. We'll share it in Jesus' glory. The transfiguration of Jesus means that we can expect the same type of transformation in the future. You don't have to turn there, but 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 2. First John chapter 3, uh, verse 2 says... Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We will be like our Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory one day. We find out that we too have faces that shine in this world. We know that Jesus is called the light of the world, but did you know that we're called the light of the world as well? Of course, this shining is not in and of ourselves, but only in as far as we live, as far as we live out our faith in love, and as far as we speak the truth in love too. The Christian life is not only a life of suffering, but it's a life of dependence upon Jesus Christ. Where his unveiled face watches us in love. And that glory that he has as we see him face to face each Sunday, that reminds us of our resurrected bodies, those glorious bodies that we are promised one day in heaven. And that is a glory that never will fade. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn, number 627.
Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.